good evening and good morning to our friends, speakers and chairs in different parts of the world. We are back again with a brand new edition of ACNS webinars. The first speaker for today is Professor Leong Sun from China. Professor Sun is a consultant neurosurgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery, Suwannu Hospital, Capital Medical University, Beijing. He specializes in the micro-neurosurgical and neurointervention treatment of cerebral vascular disease. We are extremely thankful to Professor Leong Sen for accepting an invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today, he is going to talk about surgical treatment of dural AV fistula in the endovascular age. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from USA, Professor Nira Patel. Professor Patel is an attending surgeon at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and assistant professor at the neurosurgery at the Harvard Medical School. He has completed his neurosurgical residency at the University of Wisconsin, followed by an open cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery fellowship at Mekar University, Australia, as well as an endovascular neurosurgery fellowship at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. He utilizes both minimally invasive and open techniques to treat cerebrovascular complex aneurysms, AVMs, stroke, brain bypasses, carotid disease, brain tumors, and skull-based tumors. He has surgically treated over 100 brain AVMs with excellent results, some of which are high-grade and deemed non-operable. We are extremely honored and thankful to Professor Nirav Patel for accepting our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today, he's going to talk about surgery of AVMs without embolization. The chair for the first session of today is Professor Hong Bo from China. Professor Bo is the Professor of Neurosurgery and Intervention Neuroradiology at the Shanghai Hospital, the second military medical university, Shanghai, China. His clinical focus is endovascular and surgical treatment of cerebrovascular disease, including aneurysms, ischemic stroke, carotid, and intracranial artery stenosis, cerebral and spinal vascular malformations also. Dr. Hong has served as the Vice Chairman of Neurointervention Committee of the Chinese Medical Doctors Association. The Chair for the second section of today is Professor Shubin from China. He is a Professor of Neurosurgery at the Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai. Professor Bin is the chief supporter of the ACNS webinars from China. We are extremely thankful to him for his continued support despite his very, very busy neurosurgical practice. Professor Bin holds the largest number of bypasses for Myanmar disease in the world. We are extremely thankful to Professor Bin for accepting an invitation to chair today's webinar. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this podium to Professor Shubin. So let's welcome the first speaker, uh, uh, Professor uh, Sun Li Yong. And uh, he is a very talented uh, uh, young neurosurgeon. And uh, he is a hybrid neurosurgeon, both doing the open surgery and the uh, endovascular treatment. So today his topic is surgical treatment of the cerebrospinal dural artery of venous fistula in the endovascular era. Let's welcome Professor Sun Li Yong. Thank you, everyone, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, special thanks for uh, in invitation uh, uh, for uh, Professor Xu Bin. Also, uh, the, thank you for the moderator, Professor Hong Bo. And uh, uh, let's, uh, let me share my screen. So my topic uh, today is uh, surgical treatment of the uh, cerebral uh, spinal neural AV fistula in the endovascular arrow. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce my uh, hospital that's uh, in the downtown of Beijing, and in, uh, like in Hanover. Uh, so today, my topic is uh, focused on the most uh, frequent uh, current, uh, current uh, vascular malformation of the, in the central nervous system, uh, which is a neural uh, uh, AB fistula. Is uh, AB shunt from the meningeal arteries to the neighborhood of the venous system. Uh, it can be triggered by a lot of things uh, such as a thrombosis, a trauma, tumor, and uh, inflammation. Uh, one, uh, one, one thing we, we want to uh, clear that is uh, sometimes uh, we want to emphasize that it's a shunting room for the AB fistula, not just point, which means you can't cure uh, the dural AB fistula just by block the one uh, feeding arteries. So the, we all know the, uh, we are all, all familiar with the, the classification, the, the Ghania classification, uh, classification and the modern class, uh, classification. And uh, for, uh, it's, it is important things to, for us to uh, understand that the, uh, if the fistula have the cortical winners of reflex, it become very dangerous. Uh, they have to uh, bring the high risk of a hemorrhage, which uh, need uh, uh, surgical uh, or endovascular treatment. 
uh, our target of the treatment of the dual fistula is on the winner side of the fistula. It's the beginning side of the winner side of the uh, dual fistula, not uh, only the artery occlusion. Artery occlusion alone uh, always uh, is uh, effective and curable. Uh, like a uh, room, uh, you, you, we, we all know the classic uh, uh, Southern Road can get into downtown of the room. Uh, but uh, if you come shut down the door of the classroom, uh, the, the fistula is still there. For in the, uh, in the for treatment the arrow, uh, the indication, I think the indication for microsurgery of the uh, dural fistula uh, is uh, as, as the following. Uh, for uh, as, man, uh, as me uh, 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 mentioned before, the Bowden type three or Gonia uh, type uh, three to five, uh, which is a type of uh, cortical wing type of the uh, dural fistula uh, need surgical treatment sometimes. And uh, for endovascular treatment, uh, sometimes we have a, we encountered the difficulty of the uh, transartery or transvenous assessed route to uh, navigate the microcatheter uh, just as far as possible to close to the uh, to the shunting zone to inject the uh, embolic agent to block the initial part of the artery lies wing. If you can't do that, you can't cure the fistula. Uh, also, we uh, one thing we should uh, remember that the, there are a lot of the dangerous atomosis and the supply of the uh, central uh, uh, cranial nerves uh, when we use the uh, transartery route. Especially, we use the pressure cooker. Uh, sometimes we have the complication. Uh, later on, I will uh, show my cases for complication. Uh, this is a dangerous atomosis or artery. Uh, we all know that uh, from the Lanias, Professor Lanias textbook and uh, or his uh, uh, student have uh, wrote a lot of paper about that. It's uh, from the external uh, arteries uh, to the uh, internal carotid arteries, uh, especially in the petrosal uh, uh, or, or uh, common side segment. And the dendrous arteries, which means uh, some neural arteries feeding the cranial nerve. Uh, most commonly is the uh, facial nerve uh, or, and uh, lower cranial nerves. Uh, this is my example, and uh, this is my case. It's a 38 years old female and uh, with uh, dyspnea and uh, chondroplasia. When we come to our hospital, uh, we can see the dural fistula at the cranial fire junction is here. Uh, so the sexual view of the T2 image, you can see the uh, arteries being uh, very torturous and going downwards uh, across the edema with the medulla oblongata. And uh, actually the feeding arteries came from the posterior auricular arteries, the sterile muscular branches. And another branch is the petrosal branch of the menu meningeal arteries. So I, I, because the patient already have the chondroplasia or very severe, the, the family refused to have the open surgery. So I choose the endovascular uh, approach. I use a pressure cooker, use a septal uh, double lumen balloon catheters and to try to navigate as far as possible and uh, into the uh, steroid muscle branches of the posterior auricular arteries. So this is the cost of the onyx. And also the crustal onyx uh, reach the initial part of the uh, arterialized vein uh, cure the fistula. But the problem is that the patient after the uh, endovascular treatment, they have the income, uh, facial nerve palsy. Uh, uh, luckily, they the have the incomplete recovery after the three months later. Of course, the, 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 uh, the muscle strength of uh, the get, get, uh, going better. Uh, when, when better is uh, after the rehabilitation uh, treatment. But uh, we should remember that if you use, uh, use the, uh, to some uh, dangerous arteries, and uh, especially we use the pressure cooker technique, the reflex of the onyx is uh, sometimes it's cause dangerous. And another case is in the they, they have the, in the, located in the middle fossa and also pressure branches of the middle meningeal artery feeding the fistula and going upward for the vein of Rosenso and go down to the vein of Gallup. And uh, 
I try to navigate uh, as far as possible and use also the use of uh, sexual balloon catheters to inject uh, onyx. You can see during the injection, of course, the, the onyx reach the uh, penetrates into the uh, uh, initial part of the arterized vein to cure the uh, ABF. But the problem is that you can see how uh, very dangerous the, they have the reflex of the petrosal branches in the middle fossa and going to the towards to the uh, uh, meningeal hypophysic trunk. If they reflex uh, further, they may be going to the uh, petrosal uh, commonest segment of the internal carotid arteries cause uh, severe uh, uh, amputation. After the amputation, you can see one week later, they have a very severe trigeminal neurologia and the dry eye and the facial nerve palsy. If you use the uh, middle force approach, you will see those uh, three nerves use the Kawasi approach because the uh, reflex of the onyx uh, caused the, uh, the, the, the damage of the feeding arteries, tiny feeding arteries of those nerves. And I partially recover after three months later. And another, uh, sometimes the, if you, uh, this is a superior uh, patrosal sinus uh, dura AVF, it's a very common tap for the tentary edge uh, AVF, uh, DVF. Uh, if you use the uh, endovascular approach, uh, you, you can't occlude, totally occlude the winner side. For this rupture case, it causes more problem because of re-rupture after the amputation. This is the one case. You can see the onyx count uh, totally feeling of the winner's punch. After the amputation, the patient got away bleeding again. We have to go into uh, the open surgery. You can see the winner's punch and partially uh, feeding of the onyx. And uh, this is also another uh, case is from uh, my cases. is a patient who came from another hospital. You can see the partially amputation of the cast of the onyx already reached the initial part of the draining vein. Uh, but they kind of grow the, the drainage vein. So it's very easy for open surgery, just uh, like a trigeminal neurologia, the MVD uh, surgery, just a uh, mini uh, ritual sigma approach, you can cure the disease. Uh, so let's see some uh, surgical uh, uh, cases. This is another uh, superior petrosal uh, neuro ABF, only a type 5. And, Gene downwards causes severe edema from uh, the medulla of Ganda down to the thoracic spine. You can see the arteries wind going uh, in the anterior spinal arteries, very torturous uh, flow voice signal here. And the feeding arteries uh, is came from the uh, uh, meningeal hypophysic trunk, tentorial branches. You can see the initial part of the orifice of the meningeal hypophysic trunk is very torturous from the ICA. It's so very hard to navigate. I try to uh, navigate into the manager hyperfeed trunk, but but it, it is a mission impossible. You can't go any further and you can't, it is unsafe to inject the onyx. You can't make the, the onyx to clue the winner side. Actually, you will use the working technology and your suit. You can see the uh, internal audio canal and the uh, super uh, auricular uh, auricular uh, uh, you can see the fistula just located on the edge of the petrosal uh, edge and uh, just located at the super uh, petrosal sinus. And uh, the drainage vein is uh, going downwards in the uh, petrosal vein. Uh, this is a insula nice insulation by our uh, uh, Dr. Rin Jian, and, and we published in the journal New Circle Focus. And, um, just an easy, straightforward survey. We can see the just two minutes of video. You can see the position and the three quarter position. A uh, little bit uh, short curve linear incision behind the ear. You can see the uh, lower cranial nerve and the stamina eight. And sometimes the arthritis wing uh, got a self uh, thrombosis. You can see the uh, arthritized uh, uh, notch here. And, this is an authorized drainage wind, and uh, this is a normal, uh, unauthorized drainage wind. It's a normal one. This is uh, our enemy. This is the initial part of authorized drainage wind. We should close this way. And the uh, IC green video endography uh, gave a lot of information 
and you can see the shining of the ultraviolet string to me at the uh, same times with the uh, icon or a python. You can see the this is an early shining of this ultraviolet string when and the uh, delayed uh, feeding of the normal actually also win here. So after we uh, identify this uh, uh, ultraviolet string to win, this uh, very easy straightforward survey just. Uh, just coagulate and cut. It's nothing more than the just uh, like I'm really serving. Uh, sometimes I, I rather to prefer to preserve this uh, unauthorized normal uh, wind because the, the, the carrying uh, more function for this kind of region. I, I'm afraid in, uh, if I cut this one, I cause some uh, venous uh, infraction of the surgery. You can see the some patients they have a, a significant improvement for this patient just uh, they, they got a significant improvement um, one week later you can three months later you can see mri totally resolution of the edema and andrography shows very clean another uh, simple case is the same uh, feeding fashion and uh, the fusion uh, image gave a lot of information just uh, fuse the, the bone uh, and with the uh, Angel, uh, uh, and uh, angiography, you can see the location of the fistula and uh, just a straightforward, uh, sig uh, just a mini uh, sigma, uh, a ritual sigma approach. You can reach the lesion and uh, calculate and cut. So I, I published this one and uh, we, we found some interesting uh, things that they have to coexisting the normal uh, Super patches of wind, and uh, the uh, in the uh, DB app in this region. Another uh, commonly uh, uh, DB app. Uh, sometimes they have the uh, more uh, risk of for rupture is uh, an anterior skull base. They have isomoidal DB app. Uh, for for example, this one, uh, they have very tiny torturous feeding arteries, anterior branches from the uh, summit arteries and uh, uh, atomoidal arteries. Sometimes the survey go very uh, simple, just uh, just uh, uh, you can use the mini uh, anterior uh, interhemisphere approach to reach the lesion. Uh, I prefer to cut the uh, the fall, and uh, you can see the winner's punch here cause the bleeding of this patient. You can see uh, the arteries really win and the uh, anterior skull base, and uh, you can see the initial part of the uh, fiscal point, fiscal area like, like here. There's a lot of the dilated uh, dural feeding artery at uh, the uh, uh, olfactory group here. Uh, I always use the IC green video anagraphy to confirm that there's a single shunt point. When I open that, you can see the a flashing of the IC green into the from the fistula point of, of uh, feeding the uh, dilated arteries wing. So the surgery is very easy, just uh, coagulate and cut. Uh, with uh, IC, ICG angiography. Sometimes also uh, the uh, spin skull base more frequently see uh, we, we can see a lot of the uh, fistula located in the skull base. Uh, this is another example for rupture cases and uh, signal to parental sinus uh, during ABF. It's a mini toriano approach. You can see the winner's punch here, and the uh, icy green show the early shining of the uh, fistula uh, into the arthritis winner's punch. And uh, we use hybrid OR and uh, we calculate and cut and uh, confirm the cure of the fistula. Uh, this is one reason the emergence case for me and uh, the patient came to our hospital already had the tonsil herniation. You can see open the way we use the big, little bit big incision in the middle line, posterior middle line approach. You can see the tonsil herniation at C1 level. And actually, the fistula just located in the tentorial sinus. Uh, I just uh, uh, use uh, inferior tentorial supracerebellum uh, 
space here, we can see the physical uh, initial part of the uh, arthritis strain point here. Uh, because the patient already have the herniation, so I choose uh, uh, open surgery. Also, you can see the winner's punch uh, associated with a very large hematoma in the cerebellum. We have to decompress and evacuate the blood. Another uh, very interesting uh, uh, dual AVF is uh, located at the cranial frame junction. In our center, we have a uh, little bit a uh, lot of lot, large number of cases for this uh, wider uh, location of dual AVF because they have the multiple uh, fashion of the feeding arteries. They can come from the vertebral artery, postmenial and medial artery branch, and the occipital arteries and uh, ascending pharyngeal arteries. Those arteries. Uh, are very tiny and uh, torturous. It's a little bit hard for us to navigate and to inject the uh, glue uh, and the vascular approach. So more commonly, we choose the open surgery that uh, for, for this patient. There's another case, uh, in another hospital, they try to use a balloon protection of what you brought, we injected the uh, glue, uh, but they can't cure the fissure as a kind of friend. Function, they change the big picture. Uh, you can see the medulla, the edema uh, of the medulla obligenda is uh, re uh, resolved, but uh, they change the fast training fashion. They have the more edema in the cervical uh, segment. So, when we open, uh, doing open surgery, actually the location of fistula just in the posterior middle line, uh, we almost cut the, uh, the fistula side when I well, open the dural in the posterior approach, just uh, straightforward is open surgery. And uh, you can see two weeks later, totally resolution of the edema and the postoperative MRI very clean for the, uh, for the, for the face to the room. The another case uh, for uh, the, the another hospital you inject, the, they, they uh, inject the onyx. Uh, when they open, the, when we do the open surgery again, we can see the onyx out of flow in the subarachnoid space because they choose the wrong branches, the normal branches of posterior spinal arteries or uh, lanias for the uh, lateral uh, spinal arteries. The, uh, actually, the fistula point just more uh, uh, eventually in the beneath the uh, dental ligament. Uh, for surgical uh, tips, uh, I think the uh, uh, multiple uh, multi uh, mortality uh, image fusion is very important. We recognize the fissural point. Uh, we, I always use a 3D rotation and graphy and the fusion with the, uh, uh, the bony structures. And sometimes we, all, we also check the uh, MRI and tissue image to see the venous punch, to see the uh, dilate drainage twin and to see the every detail. So during surgery, you can recognize the initial part of the drainage wing to preserve normal feeding arteries. With another uh, surgical video I published on the uh, gene nice uh, neurosurgical focus. And uh, this is a, a 49 years old male. They had weakness and numbness of the lateral limbs. You can see the pleural fistula at the craniofarian junction. The arthritis wind going downwards along the spinal cord. You can see the surgical view uh, with the bony uh, structure fusion with the 3D angiography. You can see the initial part of the fistula just located here be, uh, between the C1 laminar and the uh, 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 just, uh, uh, just above the C1 laminar. You can see the uh, this. Uh, training fashion here. You should recognize during surgery. This is surgical approach and the uh, position and the incision. Uh, you don't need a big opening, just uh, minimize the opening and uh, uh, half a C1 liner in the lesion site and uh, beneath the inferior nuclei, removes uh, partially the uh, occipital bone to open the from a magnet. Uh, someone uh, use uh, for lateral approach, but uh, I prefer the middle line approach because the fist are always located in the 
went to a site of which he brought. We, we just need a middle line approach to uh, have the right trajectory just a little bit apart and remove the uh, middle part of the occipital condyle. Is it, is it enough? It's an L shaped uh, incision of the euro because we just uh, need, uh, need the lateral exposure. Yeah. Uh, open the arachnoid. And uh, this is, uh, you need to uh, identify the normal pica, the branch of normal pica and the normal uh, posterior spinal arteries and uh, the anomaly uh, arterialized strain between and the surface of spinal cord. I touch the first dental ligament. This is a circle orientation and uh, all the nerve and the arterialized strain between. Uh, I, I note it here. You need to uh, identify that just uh, like the same uh, journey fashion. Uh, the, the, the lesion, uh, the fistula side always located in the uh, ventral side of the vertebral arteries. Uh, sometimes they beneath the dorsal root of C1. I sacrifice the C1 nerve root. There will nothing happen. So I totally exposure the initial part of the arthritis in between. I use here, I use the technique that I call the super selective uh, video endography. I close uh, with my micro forceps of initial part of the drainage when, when the uh, uh, video endography uh, going to the arthritis space, I open it, my micro forceps. You can see the shining of the arthritis drainage vein. So I confirm that the single fistula, single uh, shunting point fistula, so I can uh, easily coagulate and cut and uh, cure the disease. You can see the color change of the arthritis drainage vein. You can see the normal uh, uh, arthritis flow into this vein. And the uh, angiography is clean and the post-operative uh, MRI and the patient got getting better after surgery. So uh, another uh, where you, let's go to the, uh, from the cranial uh, fistula to the spinal dural fistula. Uh, spinal dural fistula is most frequent uh, dural, uh, uh, spinal vascular malformation, more frequent than the pure uh, spinal uh, AB, ABM. It's always have the middle age patient, uh, male uh, predominance, and um, frequently misdiagnosed and a malpractice by our colleague uh, of the uh, in the neurological department or uh, of the department. You can see the, they already have the fusion of a lumbar, uh, but uh, they can't cure the symptom of a patient because they, they can't find the uh, the uh, urofister or our sometimes our neurologist use the steroid to to. Cure the, uh, to, to trace the patient causes uh, immediately uh, uh, deterioration of the symptom. Uh, the same uh, fashion, I actually, this simple disease, a uh, lot of work need to find the fistula, location of fistula. You need good uh, catheterization of the endography. And sometimes you need the good fusion with the bone. You need to know the precisely the location of the fistula. So the Semilaminar acne is sometimes uh, always enough for the uh, cure the patient. Uh, this is our student uh, doing now the very nice work. They fusion the MRI, MRA, and the angiography together. In, you know, we, we all know sometimes it's very difficult for uh, catheterization uh, uh, of the uh, uh, for angiography in the area of patient. The, the confusion, the, the MRI with the uh, MRI with the endography during endography make the work easy. Um, actually, it's a very simple uh, disease, uh, nothing more than uh, semi laminar actomy and going straight forward, uh, calculate and cut. But a lot of work you need to, uh, uh, before the surgery, you need to uh, have the good uh, surgical plan. Uh, I personally like to uh, join this uh, image uh, for the for the, in the surgical view, so I can identify the uh, drainage fashion, uh, all the tortures, all the uh, curve, so I can recognize during my surgery. Uh, you can see I 
uh, I don't need to open the arachnoid. This uh, sometimes you just push it away and confirm with the acid green when I open my microforceps, I can see the feeding of the uh, understanding green within the arthritis green. Uh, secure the patient. You can see a lot of patients, they have the, already have a fusion here uh, by our ophthalmic uh, uh, colleague, uh, but uh, they can't cure the disease. They have more problem. And actually, there's a single fistula here that causes severe edema. The surgery is quite simple. And uh, just need to confirm with the uh, understanding brain. Uh, sometimes the fistula have a very low location, like the sacred canal. Um, sometimes they, they have very, very low location. Uh, we already uh, use a lot of the cases for in the heavy OR. Sometimes I, uh, we uh, insert a consolidation of the arthritis treatment by puncturing it. Uh, by puncture the arthritis treatment and the uh, consolidation of microcatheters, you can see what you can puncture it and uh, navigate the microcatheters and uh, fix it, the microcatheter with the knot and the uh, 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 and the aneurysm clip. Then you can retrograde uh, inject onyx to the low location. You just uh, open the laminar in the number uh, L5 level, and uh, you can go a long way to the second canal. And no need to uh, open the secondary uh, the laminar because it's already near to the, the, the anal region. It will sometimes have a lot of uh, problem for CSM linkage or infection. And can see the like the winner's approach to cure the AVM. We use uh, same uh, idea, same uh, uh, surgical uh, uh, treatment to retrograde and inject the onyx to reach the location uh, which we don't want to open it. This is you can see the cast on the onyx and uh, cure the AVM here in the AV fistula here in the sacral canal and uh, uh, the cure the, the disease. Uh, because of short of time, uh, let me uh, close my uh, speech. Uh, I want to give my special thanks for Professor Yukikado. Already when I was young, as he organized the winter seminar. And also, uh, I want to give my special uh, thanks to Professor Bin Xu, who was my mentor and master surgeon. And uh, very, uh, very uh, thank you for me. Uh, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And okay. A uh, very nice presentation. Uh, Professor Sun, actually, he is a very uh, talented neurosurgeon. Uh, he can do almost everything. <laughs> uh, also doing some bypass, yeah. I really is the way Professor Hongbo would like to say. Any comments? Yes. Any comments from Professor? So we will move to the next lecture. If there are any comments from the audience, we would welcome. Dr. Liu, my co-host. Uh, thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Liam, for a very nice presentation. Uh, I, 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 I have a question to ask, Professor. In the uh, uh, first few cases that you show, a uh, patient with a facial nerve palsy, acute facial nerve palsy, and probably the patient may have some form of headache. So uh, in those cases, especially with acute neurological uh, deficit, uh, how often do you deal with, do you uh, start with uh, CT angiogram first or, or what type of uh, imaging modality uh, make you suspect there will be, uh, the patient is suffering from AV fistula, especially those without bleeding? Thank you, Professor. Yeah, uh, normally we, we for dual fistula, we, we perform the angiography to know the, uh, know the uh, location or the feeding or arteries space or venous space. Uh, the first choice, of course, in the uh, endovascular arrow is uh, we, we, we will balance the, the risk or a complication or a benefit for a patient. Uh, so first line treatment, of course, is the endovascular treatment. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, 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 according to yourself, your ability or your microcaster, what, what do you have? Uh, you should uh, have the plan whether or not you can navigate the microcaster close to the uh, fistula point, or uh, or uh, make the control the reflex or onyx. 
not too much, especially in the in the uh, Scobies region, because there are a lot of the dangerous artery and dangerous atmosis, uh, uh, and uh, the the problem of the facial palsy for for over reflex or over injection is terrible because it make the patient quality of life is terrible. Also, some palsy of the lower cranial nerve becomes the swelling things. And we also encountered some uh, terrible cases uh, in the early early time. Um, we make the reflex onyx into the internal carotid arteries. We cause uh, disaster, uh, ablation, infarction, large infarction intracranially, or into the uh, vertebral artery when they uh, ambulize the uh, some cranial cervical uh, big tumor, uh, high uh, high risk, uh, high uh, very uh, very high uh, flow. Blood flow uh, tumor here. They, they, they make the dangerous atmosis, dendrotic artery dilated. Uh, you, uh, I, I, I counter the, the, I inject the glue and the glue uh, going to the uh, vertebral artery. It's a very terrible. Uh, my second question, Prof. Uh, you, you mentioned the term uh, fistula zone rather than uh, 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 fistula point. And, yeah. and you emphasize that uh, those uh, fistula zones are mainly used for AV uh, uh, dura fistula with uh, multiple feeders. And, and in your practice, if there's a multiple feeders, you would tend to use onyx to block the when, uh, uh, the venous uh, uh, approach. And if uh, a single, single uh, uh, arteria, then you will go direct. Uh, so do you have any algorithm in which case that you would we use the onyx uh, for the venous access, and which one that you will direct uh, disconnect the fistula? Yeah, because you show all, both. Yeah. Yeah, this is all about the the uh, the uh, accessibility uh, for endovascular or open surgery. Uh, if you can make the embolic agent such as the onyx, we, we always use onyx for your fistula treatment. If you can ensure your the, the onyx can feeding totally feeding the initial part of the arteries treated ring, not the the for, further feeding to the normal uh, functional uh, venous system, just uh, block the initial part of arteries treated ring, shut down the door. You can cure the disease, uh, but sometimes it uh, it's all about the accessibility for for this time. Maybe in future we have a more uh, micro double lumen balloon uh, in Europe or American, they already use the mini sector. They can navigate the mini sector as much as possible. Uh, and, uh, uh, maybe better, doing better uh, 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 in my cases uh, in future. Uh, but uh, in this time, uh, sometimes open surgery is quite simple. You can see the normal structure, normal anatomy structure, just uh, just according to the different location, you choose uh, individually simple uh, approach. You can reach uh, the the uh, initial part of the joint joint, just uh, disconnect it. Sometimes it's a, uh, I think it's safe and uh, it's a durable um, for your face. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. I can see Dr. Itichai wants to ask something. Yes, my dear friend. Yes. Yeah. Well. Hello, Dr. Li Yongsun. Hi, hi. From Ping. Yeah, my friends. <laughs> very good presentation because uh, you, uh, me and you, it's, a, it's the same way for treatment, both in the vascular and open surgery. I totally agree for the open surgery in the special location of the accuracy below the visua. And I appreciate so much that you can make it so for the pre-op uh, fusion imaging is really beautiful and we clearly, in my institute, cannot do like you. <laughs> it's very, very clear and, and it's very good. And uh, in the first case that you present about the complication of the onyx, to cause of facial palsy. Uh, in this region, for my opinion, it's really dangerous because this is a cause to uh, uh, about the facial arcade. This yeah, is the bands yeah. of uh, styloma band from the middle mental artery 
posterior auricular artery and occipital artery, this is uh, we need to careful for yeah. prevention of ionic reflux to this area. This is a uh, scenario, uh, the worst scenario that I have met also. But uh, at the final, I really happy to see you to present our upcast and very really good outcome and very really good uh, and very really beautiful op operative field. Thank you, my thank friends. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Teacher. Long time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. For joining us. Asha. For joining today. I think if there are no more questions, we can go to our second talk, for which I would like to invite Professor Shubin to invite Professor Nirav. Okay, we'll move to the next lecture. Uh, I, I will introduce Dr. Nirav Patel. He is the attending surgeon at the Department of Neurosurgery at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, today, he will talk about techniques for brain AVM surgery to avoid pre-operation embolization. Please. Thank you. Thank you, everyone that's put together this wonderful opportunity and in this difficult time with COVID across the, the world, uh, it's nice to at least meet with uh, all of you today, this morning. And, and uh, thanks for letting me talk about my favorite topic, which is brain AVM. Uh, my message is a simple that I think a brain AVM surgery can be done to beat the natural history. That whatever we do, it should be in terms of beating that history. If you want to embolize, then the embolization plus surgery should be less than surgery alone. We have to beat the results in Aruba and ruptured cases are different, but we, we still need to make sure that we don't fall back on complications caused by the hematoma. You know, we, we can do better than that. Um, it's a simple technique that I have learned from others. Um, dissect the arteries, close them, then dissect the AVM. And I guess the message is one that I learned from my teachers and I, it's such a great opportunity to be able to share it with you today because it works. It works for me. It can work for, for anyone who's dedicated to this task. Um, the natural history has been written very clearly now. It's 2.5%, 2.2%. So we have to beat that. If it's ruptured, it's a worse natural history. We have to beat that. And as I said, surgery plus embolization, the outcome and risk should be less than surgery alone. And I don't think it can be. We just have to change our techniques for surgery alone. Um, these are wonderful outcomes by master neurosurgeons across the world. And I put this up because whatever we do as young neurosurgeons or early career neurosurgeons, we have to stack ourselves against their outcomes. Um, so that was our initial publication of early career neurosurgeons learning these techniques and to say, if you learn them and practice them, then your results also can be good. Um, this was, uh, you know, maybe 87 or 100 cases of, of all the fellows and put together the Spetzer Martin grades ones and twos are less than, um, than the, uh, the cumulative uh, morbidity by master neurosurgeons or at least the same. So I think it means we can continue doing this work. And I have done that and this in my own experience to date. These are the 92 brain AVMs uh, without embolization uh, operated in the last eight years. And the majority are Spetzer Ponce A, but some are in the B and C categories. And still, um, I want to show that these techniques are utilizable across grade, location, and size. So, uh, you know, you see this case, it's straightforward. You're going to operate GCS3T. And if you do a wonderful job, patient will do well. Um, that is very clear. The hematoma is um, removed. And even though the patient has a terrible initial GCS, they get better. So I think it's in incumbent upon us to try. Here's another case, terrible hematoma, GCS3T, again, acute surgery, but we can take the hematoma, take the AVM, and patient does very well. 
Uh, another case, similar situation, 3T. My point with this is we don't give up on these young people with hematomas. We can change their life. It's very different, it seems to me, than GCF3T from trauma or from subarachnoid hemorrhage. Grade 5 Hunt and Hess is maybe different. So we published this to try to document that, that patients with AVM uh, hemorrhage is different than patients with aneurysm hemorrhage or traumatic GCS3T, and then their outcomes can be better uh, on the whole. And there's this developed a grading system that we now use, ruptured AVM grading scale. Um, the point is that the microsurgery for brain AVM is different than tumor surgery and the techniques um, that if we utilize them differently, they can help us make uh, great outcomes and we don't need to use embolization. I'm not saying embolization is bad, but it comes with a risk. Uh, the risk of embolization is not zero and nothing is free. So I practice endovascular nerve surgery, open vascular nerve surgery, and, and even in, in, in surgeons much better than, than me, the complication rate of embolization can be up to 7% per application. So that's a difficult hole to dig yourself out of. So rather we can uh, use surgical embolization. These are techniques that were taught to me by Professor Morgan in Sydney, Australia. And, and I think it's, it's uh, generalizable to young neurosurgeons that, that, that you can learn this and do a good job. The essence of the technique is the arachnoid dissection. Then we take the arteries on the surface of the AVM and, and before we dissect the AVM in its entirety, then we should go straight down to the bottom and take the last artery. Then the AVM is very soft. Now you can really manipulate it. You can dissect it out of even allicum cortex uh, safer. So that's the point. And here I'll try to illustrate that. Um, inflow arteries in arteriovenous malformations, the brain can come from scalp, transosseous, dural, sulcal, white matter, and then the cone. And these all have to go first, as you can see on these pictures, even recurrent AVMs, previously operated AVMs can have a lot of inflow from the scalp and the transosseous. So we should do maybe a bigger craniotomy than normal. Again, not like tumors. Uh, we can do a falsine window to bring the AVM directly to us. So transfalsine. Here in the operating room, what I like to put up and what I learned is focus on the artery target. So we put the arrows, we might use navigation. And we said this one first, then this one, this one, and strategically dissect um, the sulci that incorporate these arteries. So here, sharp dissection, finding the artery and cross clamping the artery. And just doing this all the way around, even before any real dissection of the AVM nidus per se. Then this may be the most important thing, that, that artery at the bottom is a very important artery. It will fill that AVM up. Even if you took all the superficial arteries, the AVM is still not quiet until we take that one at the bottom. And so the main difference here is going there early in the operation, straight down, um, before going around and around. So here is the classic teaching in the top left, which is like a tornado, but instead of that, straight down, make a beeline, drop a cone right to the bottom, and we can um, bipolar and get down to that last artery, clip it. Now the AVM is soft, and it is soft before venous return is obstructed by injuring the veins. Right, so taking the phone, the cone first is very important, I think, and that has made all the difference in being able to do these without embolization. Uh, the cone has always got a feeder. I guess I should be so bold to say that, but you can see here uh, in this ladder, this uh, AP projection, there is uh, feeding arteries coming through the deep tissues from the MCA, and it comes up, and it's always there, and we can get it early. Now, here's a different illustration, but to illustrate the point, straightforward, Spetzer Martin grade two arterial venous malformation in a medical student, uh, you know, vision is a concern, but what we can do again, just to illustrate the point, taking the arteries after sulcal dissection, taking the deep artery. So the deep artery is not that deep, it's straightforward, here it is. 
it's almost superficial, right? But we would naturally do that. We naturally are gonna put a clip on that artery. Now the AVM is nice and soft. And once it is soft, there's much less risk of bleeding and it's much easier to dissect out of eloquent tissue and the patient can, can have a good outcome even in eloquent and that patient didn't have any visual change. Here's another case, straight for, again, straightforward cases, Spetzer Martin, Spetzer Ponce A. Uh, large AVM, right frontal, she presents with seizure, but uh, interestingly, she's had hemorrhage in the past that she was unaware of, which you can see in uh, SWI or gradient ecto MRI, we can see previous hemorrhage. Straightforward, again, take the arteries, all of them, even the one deep. And so here's just the illustration top left picture. We see a large craniotomy, large exposure of the AVM, then the ampassage arteries, clipping, uh, is it safer for the endothelium of the parent vessel to protect it? And so these little sun clips made by Dr. Sun um, close off those little arteries there. Then not, not circumferential, but going straight down to the cone, you can see now when you've taken the superficial arteries, the AVM is soft and I can put a retractor on the AVM and it allows me to go straight to the bottom where you can see at the ventricle, there is going to be a small feeder now the avium is soft and it can be resected without difficulty. In this illustration is a different concept, but bring the avium to me, you know, bring it to its superficial level. So even if it's a deep interhemispheric avium, as you can see in the, in the top right of the picture, by interhemispheric, we can go transpulsing from the opposite side, getting the arterial feeders before the circumferential dissection. So here's first simple illustration. This is a um, young man, uh, so middle-aged man with seizures, and we come from the opposite side because as we go here, uh, AVM is on um, the patient's left, but I, if I come from the right side and I cut across the falks right here, what will happen is I'll have a good view of the ACA arteries. I can cross clamp them, before touching the AVM. Here you notice we haven't touched AVM. We're just gonna take the heat out of it by cutting across those AVM arteries by temporary clipping them. Now the AVM is very soft, much less risk of bleeding, and it can be resected in its entirety at that point. It, you know, some of these older AVMs can have uh, calcification as you saw there, but it comes out without difficulty. And here's the CT scan. You start on the, uh, on the right side, go to the opposite side, and you don't have any retraction um, on the brain itself. Uh, another similar concept, small AVM motor cortex of the leg area, starting on the right, going across the faults, ending on the left. Here you see the pictures in the bottom, uh, cut the faults, go across, find the ACA vessels feeding uh, the AVM, cross clamp them, and then resect the AVM. And, you know, cutting across the fox is, is straightforward. It's like opening any other dural tissue. It may bleed, but we can bipolar it. Uh, again, in the post-op, you see there's not a retraction injury we're just coming from one side to the other. It gives us better space, a bigger space to expose the early arteries and take the AVM out. Here's another case. Uh, this man was 43, he's hemorrhaged. He has a, a large AVM in a deep seated location. But you know, what's great about these T2 images, you can high resolution, you can see the, the parenchyma, you can see the ventricle and you know what part of this AVM is going to be, you know, which part do I have to delicately dissect and which part I don't. And here you can see everything you need to see in this T2. Here's the ACA vessels, that's a target. There's a PCA at the bottom, that's a target. So how am I gonna do that? Well, yeah, you could embolize or you can do it surgically. And with surgery, we can get there early in the operation. Here's the lateral angiogram. So again, I illustrate ACA at the top, PCA at the bottom. 
And the PCA, you can see it comes to the midline on that AP angiogram, it comes to the midline. So if I come from one side, I can get to the other and grab it early. So I wanna show you that for this AVM. I think it's a real, it's a real great way to do it. Um, here's the targets illustrated in uh, different views on CT angiogram. And what we see on the top right is that deep feeder. It's always there, posterior lateral colloidal in this case. We can get that early in the operation. So he, we chose to do him in a semi-sitting position with the Mayfield going anteriorly. There's a large bi uh, occipital craniotomy above, of course, above the torcula. And here's the transpulsing window starting on the left, then cutting the dura in the falks. Starting on the right now, we're cutting across the falks and back and forth. Now look, here's the medial surface of the AVM. It's brought to you, right? Now it's very superficial. And there's the PCA feeder. So next, click the superficial feeders. When this, you know, this progression of clipping those feeders, it just makes sense. But the whole, if you do it completely, AVM will be nice and soft. And then it won't bleed even if we touch it in the wrong way, which can happen, right? So here's the last feeder is deep in the ventricle, but the AVM is soft. So we can dissect a little bit of the nidus, go straight down, maybe the size of a patty. And then we're in the ventricle. There's choroid plexus. Here's the, the artery. The artery is cross clamped with the sunk clip to take the turgor out and the bipolar and cut. Then the final step then is complete circumferential dissection, cutting the vein, and, and then of course the rest is straightforward. It comes right out. It's not bleeding, it's okay. Um, these are the post-op images for him, and there's not a, like a retraction injury or any of that, and he did great. Uh, he did require a shunt later. Um, it's, this technique is useful for posterior fossa AVMs, and here's middle of the night you might be faced with this problem. Uh, young nurse or young residents, here's a big hematoma, you got to save this guy's life. You want to get in there, you're not, you don't even have time for an angiogram. So we go straight to the operating room, uh, prone position, far lateral, we know the arteries of of concern based on the CT angiogram, you know pica is gonna be it, but there it is, there's your feeding artery. It's dilated, it's lard, you know, right, it's dilated. Here's an aneurysm, there's a thrombosed vessel coming out of that pica, but basically it's the same concept, cross clamping that artery, taking control early, and then circumferential dissection once we have the deep feeder taken out as well. I'll skip through that. AVM comes out, a nice hemostasis at the end. That's really important. Postoperative angiogram looks good. Same thing for a young woman. Here's another hematoma, GCS3T. And this, this patient did have an angiogram because she got a decompression first, which is fine. Um, here's the dura. I'll skip this video. It's the same as before, right? It's the exact same process, finding the arteries early before any of the veins are taken. And what I mean by veins is not just the draining veins, but the vein, the whole nidus of the AVM, the outside of it is all veins. So anytime we dissect it, we're going to, we're going to close that venous outflow, which is going to tighten the nidus. So it's better to take the arteries first. Here's the post-op. And she did great with MRS of zero. Uh, here's some motor examples. Uh, right frontal in a 24-year-old uh, motor cortex example. Because is eloquence any different? What, do you need to embolize for eloquence? I don't think so. I think if anything, um, same concepts maybe apply even more so with eloquent brain AVM. Here's the lateral MCA seen on the CT angiogram. All of the targets can be well acquired on the CT angiogram. Posterior ACA anterior ACA. And as I said, you can just circle them preoperatively. And then in your mind, you walk in, you know what you're going to look for. Um, first, the dissection in the arachnoid space. I, I, I learned this from Dr. Morgan with the sharp 11 blade. Um, 
and I think it's a really effective way to continue the dissection without injuring uh, brain because we, we are just working on the arteries. That's our goal. And then cross clamping them. Once it's soft, now a retractor on the AVM and then bipolaring down towards the ventricle. I can use navigation to make sure we're going in the right trajectory and then sweeping the loops of AVM back towards zonitis. Now here you're going to see ventricle. And this is very early in the operation, right? Before uh, injuring the rest of the AVM. Now, once the ventricle is dealt with and you cross clamp the bottom artery, the rest we can circumferentially dissect and remove uh, in its entirety. Now, I'll just make a comment. The, the, this went very well, but in motor cortex patients, in my experience, have always woken up weak and, and we just have to be patient. They will get better in time if there's no infarct and if, if I haven't taken too much of good brain. Uh, so when dissecting in motor cortex, I think it's important to be very, very, very much on top of the AVM, leaving behind uh, all of the brain that, is, that, that we have to leave behind. So you can see at three months, she was walking with a cane, but at one year, she's not had a problem at all. And I think you have to be patient and inform the patient ahead of time that they're going to need some rehab. This is an older man who for years was told is inoperable AVM, but kept having seizures and difficulty with his arm. Uh, here you can see at the bottom, the deepest feeder is always there. And we just plan ahead of time. How am I going to get to that deepest feeder? I'm going to do a circumferential dissection, cross clamp the superficial arteries, go straight down to the deepest feeder. Same concept. So here's the video, large craniotomy, large durotomy, here I'm just showing the deepest arteries that we can find very early in the operation. These are still photographs, but the video here is about to play. And interestingly, in this case, what I learned, you know, because of that big venous pouch after resection, it thrombosed and it, you need time. Uh, he needed more time to recover because of the thrombosis. So here's the video. Um, 11 blade dissecting the arachnoid of the of the vessels and we put the the suction is used to put the arachnoid on stretch the 11 blade then disconnects the arachnoid wherever we can put the arachnoid on stretch we can sharply dissect with the blade but the first purpose is to find these arteries the superficial artery here seen very well on the preoperative imaging corresponds and so we can cross clamp that artery and keep going like this here's another one and then as i said the next step is to go deep before going around the AVM. And we have done that here. And then AVM is soft and the rest of it can be dissected in a normal fashion as if it had been embolized, right? But you don't risk that embolic complication, though, though it's beautiful when it's done. And if you can get it, very nicely embolized without a complication, that's wonderful. But I think even in the best of hands, there is a risk that there could be a problem. And so this technique instead, if practiced and employed, I think will decrease the risk of a complication in long term. Now it's very, very soft. And we just take our time sweeping the loops of the AVM back into the nidus dissecting it right out of the um, right out of the white matter. Here it is at the end. The last thing we do, of course, is the vein, putting cross clamps, taking the vein. And then really important that if there's any bleeding at the end of the operation, it be stopped because post-operative bleeding is terrible. We want to make sure hemostasis is absolute. So look at this, so he had a thrombosis. That's not a hemorrhage, that's a thrombosed large vein. You see pre and post, and that just takes time to go away. You can treat with heparin or not, doesn't matter, but over time they will do great. And as he did, it can take up to three months for that to resolve. Um, young woman, again, another motor cortex case. And I show it again to say that we don't need embolization and even embolization here might be too dangerous because of the ompicized nature of MCA feeding arteries in 
eloquent territory. The MCA might be on passage and it's going, uh, AVM is going, and then if we get onyx, we may, we may cause a stroke. So here in the angiogram, you see the two arteries, lateral MCA, medial ACA. A lot of it, you know, a lot of this imaging, the preoperative imaging, CTA, MRI, I think you can really put it together in your head uh, or use a navigation, but, but you know where you need to go. Uh, you study it enough and here's the intraoperative pictures, there's the MCA feeder. And once uh, you cross clamp all the feeders, you get to the bottom and then you can take it out and, and it'll go well. So this is the video, uh, same process. Sharp dissection. And, and as I said, we can use navigation. You can make circles around the target. So you can put the probe right on it and say, okay, I found it. Next. Okay. Number two, next. Number three, next. And this way, every time you put a cross clamp clip on, the AVM is getting softer and softer and softer. Now, you notice that these are temporary clips, just in case I've made a mistake. I, I don't need to make a permanent clip and cut it. Maybe um, as I dissect more, I realize, oh no, this is not AVM artery, this is an on passage, or I didn't put the clip close enough to the AVM, let me move the clip. That, that's the reason for the um, temporary nature. And then we can, at the end of the operation, change them for permanent clips closer to the AVM. Here you see, look at that. See that the vein is very soft. I can put my knife on it. I can put my suction on it and it allows a, a very nice clean plane to be dissected. And now if there is bleeding, you can put a tamponade of a patty. It's not torrential bleeding. Of course, if this happens at the very step, the very beginning of the operation, it's a much different problem. And you, we should be ready with blood in the room and have um, tamponade and, and, and go from there, but hopefully it doesn't happen. Uh, okay, and then in the motor area, then using a, a small fine by non-state bipolar is very helpful. And it comes out. And again, I try to say, try to leave behind every last possible neuron that is not necessary to come out. And that, you know, when you're doing that dissection in the white matter, follow the loop out. And if it goes back, bring it back into the, into the nidus. So again, patience, I think, you know, again, three months for an MRS score of one, but, but it takes rehab and the patient should be committed to doing a lot of exercises and getting back that function because it's right in motor. Here's an interesting case, young man, uh, large ABM, Spetzer Margaret tree with seizures, increasing frequency, but the same concept holds true. We did a functional MRI, which some people might say, can that work? Does it not work? I guess the point is the functional MRI might be helpful, but we should not rely on it. It, it may underestimate the amount of eloquent tissue. We know from anatomy where the eloquent tissue is. And when Dr. Spetzer wrote the first paper, he said, you just need to look on you know, an angiogram or even a CT, so in the expected region of eloquence. So um, maybe functional doesn't matter, but so here again, just dissecting this ABM out is finding those arteries and labeling what is eloquent tissue and then working backwards. I think in this, in this man's case, we again use the navigation to circle the arteries Here's the dissection, which now I've showed many times, so I'll move on. Cross clamping the arteries. And you know, I, I never, we don't rush this. I don't rush it. It's the most enjoyable part of ABM surgery is the dissection of the night of the arachnoid. Uh, just turn the clock off. You know, this thinking about just the neurosurgery here. Um, same thing once we're in the white matter. You know, try not to think about the preoperative imaging in the white matter. Rather, just 
What is the AVM telling me? I'm dissecting, it's going this way, let me follow it. Okay, I'm dissecting, it's going this way, let me follow it. In the mistakes that I've made, if I close my mind and just, oh, here it is, I'm gonna make a wall right here. It's transnidal, it's bleeding after bleeding, bleeding. No, it's not necessary, it's a problem. In, in his case here, you see um, something neat here. There's a little bit of this squiggly tissue left in motor, but because it was so eloquent, I didn't go after it and it thrombosed. And that speaks to the importance of the post-operative management in these cases. Keeping the blood pressure low will prevent hemorrhage or delayed hyperperfusion syndrome or hemorrhage in arterial capillary venous hypertension syndrome. So in the grade three, uh, four and five patients are kept in uh, induced hypotension uh, until remodeling occurs. And here's the remodeling. See this post-op day zero in angiogram. Each the blue arrow compared to the blue arrow on post-op day seven. The arteries come down in size. They've been maximally dilated their whole life. But once the AVM is ablated, the artery will start to shrink. Um, and you just need to wait. And once you see that happening, then you can release the hypotension and you'll be more, we'll feel more confident the patient should do well without a hemorrhage. Uh, AVMs take you all around the world. You get to meet great people. These are in Puerto Rico, young woman. Um, this is a straightforward AVM, but we never disrespect them. You know, it's large enough that Bleeding can be a problem. Um, the difficulty I had here was that I didn't expose enough on the medial side. And so a lesson is bigger craniotomy is just safer. Uh, again, the targets, you can pick them up on the early angiogram phase. You put it up in the operating room and put in arrows. There's the deep feeder, that'll be last. And I'll skip this video, it's just like all the rest. Although, AVMs are beautiful, but um, I could stare at you know videos all day. But have a time commitment. Uh, so there's the post-op, and she did well. Again, here's the ICU. The patient is kept very hypotensive until remodeling occurs. So yeah, there is complications from that, PE, pneumonia, etc. But if we can prevent delayed postoperative hemorrhage in high-grade AVMs, then the patients do very very well, and we can treat. We can treat pneumonia. Another case is the grade four AVM in a young man. This is probably speech area, no embolization. I, I think again, I've, I've beat that uh, dead horse, but large craniotomy, arachnoid dissection with purpose, right? Looking for those targets, each one very, very important. And not much of this AVM comes to the surface. So a lot of this work has to be done adjacent to the vein, which is a bit risky because uh, we haven't really deflated the AVM yet, but it can be done uh, safely, I think, with the arachnoid dissection techniques with an 11 blade. See now the vein is getting softer. I can push on the vein more without ripping it. And this case was such an illustrative, you know, the minute we took this PCA feeder, AVM was like a balloon that's just deflated. And it made the whole case super safe after that point. I could see it. You know, it happens in front of your eyes. You take that last feeder and, and it's just soft. And you know now, okay, now I just enjoy dissecting. It's not going to bleed too much. You can see it's very soft. The vein is blue. And we can take it out. And then hemostasis. And then um, you know, maximal medical therapy for the post-operative science to prevent any hemorrhage. He, oh, he, you know, the complication I caused there is that uh, in positioning, he had a brachial plexus problem, which took six months to recover in his right shoulder, but it did recover. His speech was fine, uh, which is the AVM, but every detail matters. So overlooking the uh, you know, positioning is not too great. But he got better, thankfully. Our patients are, you know, we get lucky. Here's another speech area, AVM. Um, 
and, and just saying, look, she woke up, she was aphasic, but given time, she's gone back to full speech, but it takes you know, a couple months. This lady took a couple of months, so we have to prepare the patients for that kind of transition. Um, I'll just show this last example and, and wrap it up. This was a, a young uh, uh, pr professor and he, he had seizures. You can see the AVM is ineloquent. It's just adjacent. So I, I personally, just to make a note, I have not graded this as eloquent. I called it a special mark in grade three because it does not go into um, visual cortex. It's adjacent to, but I know there's some subject subjectivity to that. Uh, here's how I think about it. PCA feeder on the top left, MCA feeder in the top bottom, ACA feeder in the right bottom. And, and what it means, that's gonna be the stages and the cross clamps. Here's the full angiogram. Uh, in this, you may notice that there's an external um, uh, contribution. You see, you see the external arteries in the top right going to the fistula and to the AVM. And we can take those very easily on the craniotomy. So again, here's a bite, occipital, and just opening the scalp flap takes the arteries that were trans, uh, trans uh, from the skin and then the opening the dura. Now here, that was MCA feeder, first one. Now ACA feeder, I use the navigation, find it. We know where it is, we can confirm with navigation. Now the AVM is getting softer. So here, uh, dissecting a large vein. Here's the inferior portion. Now, going to the opposite side, opening the falks, but what happened here? It didn't go as I had planned. I thought I could get the PCA from here, but it was too far over. So now I'm stuck. I need to get to the PCA. I don't want to do this AVM dissection without getting that last artery. So here I found the PCA artery almost through the AVM, like in the, in the, through the veins, dissecting, 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 very narrow corridor. Here's the PCA on the ipsilateral side, cross clamping it. Now, now, you know, you see it, it's become soft. You feel better. You take a sigh of relief uh, that this, this will be a night, there you go. You can see its AVM is much softer after occluding the arteries. And then we can put a retractor on the, uh, put a retractor on the nidus and I can bipolar uh, cleanly without too much uh, bleeding. So with the bipolar, the, the idea is bipolar and suction, bipolar suction, bipolar suction. So you can stay right on top of the nidus. See, it's soft, it's not ripping. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to take them out of the brain once they're very soft and pliant like this, compliant. Then of course, the last step, once all the arteries are done is the veins. And the veins are finally cross clamped and cut. Now much of this ABM should be free. I, I, I sometimes I jump too fast and there will be something stuck here. So I think going slow when you're mobilizing it, just to be sure you've got it all. Here's a vein going into the falks, and that's cut at the very end. And the very last one going to the sagittal sinus is cut. AVM comes out. And, and again, the next step is the hemostasis. If there's anything left, this is the time. I asked the anesthesiologist to bring the blood pressure up high to see if there's anything left. Uh, so this is his post-op angiogram, which we do on day zero and on day seven. Two angiograms, just to be sure nothing is opened up on day seven. Uh, here's the remodeling that I was talking about. So at post-op day one, you see the yellow compared to the post-op day seven, the yellow. You see the arteries are getting smaller as the shear stress changes in their lumen, in the endothelium, the smooth muscle starts to contract and brings the artery to smaller. Then we feel better that now the patient won't have a delayed post-operative hemorrhage. Uh, so in conclusion, I think that microsurgery is very, very safe for brain AVM cure. With these techniques, I think you can avoid embolization, which reduces the complication risk and improves the MRS at 12 months. Um, it does take longer in operating. It, you know, there's more, uh, more to do with these techniques when you avoid embolization, but I think it's better for the patient. Uh, I think the techniques can be taught, learned, 
practice, and then we can keep track of our outcomes to be sure that they're as good uh, as they should be. And then hopefully we can keep teaching from our complications to make things better. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone uh, who put this together. And I uh, thank you for your time and have a great day. It's a beautiful and a wonderful uh, presentation. So thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Congratulations, Dr. Patel. So yes. very nice presentation. And uh, your surgical field is very clean. And uh, I like your strategy, very straightforward directly to, uh, to the uh, deep feeders of the AVM. Very nice presentation, very impressive. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, uh, how, how many cases do you totally have? Uh, I, in my experience of operating yes. the nine, 92, no embolization and mm -hmm. somewhere over hundred with embolization. The, the cases that are presented to me new uh, I don't embolize, but if it has been embolized elsewhere, I have operated, so that's different. But in this context of this is 90, 92 cases. Yeah, I agree with you. I also do the AVM uh, resection without embolization because uh, if the nidus was a uh, hard, uh, it's very difficult to control the deep feeders. That's right. You never yeah. get that embolization at the bottom anyway, so you have to go yeah. there. And now it's difficult, the AVM is not mobile it's a rock mm -hmm. so yeah. it's difficult to get down to the bottom yes. And, yes and i think then it's more like a tumor and uh, it's a very different strategy yeah very nice so how long it, it would take uh, average for resection at avm because uh, you mentioned you are not very fast when you res uh, dissect the uh, arachnoid membrane yeah that's fingers. a great question um, I think the size is directly correlative to time. It's a grade one and two, we can be done by 12 o'clock, one o'clock in the morning start. But when it becomes a high grade large AVM, I find myself, it goes to 5 p.m., 6 p.m. It's a long day, but I have a wonderful team, uh, wonderful fellows, residents, everyone is available to help. Um, but you know, more that I do, the harder I think the surgery is, I, I, I have a higher expectation and maybe time for me has not gotten any faster. <laughs> it's still the same. <laughs> uh, maybe for master neurosurgeons, their time is, but for me also, I enjoy it. Uh, it's, it's such a beautiful thing to see and work on. It's a privilege and no rush. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that you, Sometimes you, you use a very uh, narrow corridor to going straight forward to the deep feeders. So you mentioned you use uh, uh, neural navigation. Yes, sir. Um, the, the reason for the navigation is two things. When you make a very narrow corridor, then we don't disrupt the venous outflow along the surface of the AVM. But the navigation can say intraoperatively, what's the fastest, easiest way that I may get to the uh, cone of the AVM early? And uh, of course, you should, I try to avoid eloquent tissue. So if it's a motor cortex, come to the other side, use the navigation. Now I know the trajectory. And I just stay on the AVM um, and, and go to the ventricle. I should say, again, that all of these things that I'm talking about, I learned from my teachers, uh, Dr. Morgan and Dr. Baskaya and people before him. And, and I hope that by sharing it, other people can, can pick it up. These small tricks makes a big difference. Yes, but sometimes when you uh, coagulate the big feeders at the surface, actually, uh, the deep feeders would be expanded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, so what's your cons uh, what uh, what's your consideration for this kind of situation? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess if I can get to the deep feeder very early in the operation, then it's still better than waiting until we completely dissect. And another option is that. Um, you know, if we do get bleeding down at the bottom early in operation, we can put a patty there and be very 
confident that because we did the other large arteries, it's, it's going to be controllable. I think so. I, I, in my experience, I haven't seen it when it, we get, or when we do it right, when I do it right, it's, I think it's very safe. But if I injure the artery, then it's a different story. Now. Okay, great. Thank so you. I have a question, Dr. Patel. So in what kind of situation you will make decision that the patient need to be sedationed and put into hypertension? Oh, that's so a great question. Again, I learned from Dr. Morgan, um, grade three, four, and five, greater than 3.5 centimeters, I keep the patient in uh, induced hypotension until arterial remodeling. So I know ahead of time, if the size of the AVM is greater than three and a half centimeters, and it is a grade three, four, or five, then we'll do the induced hypotension until arterial remodeling. So you will put the uh, patient for as long as seven days or just yeah. a few days? Sometimes it's just a few days. The CT angiogram can help understand the remodeling. So even at maybe sometimes 72 hours, I can see the arteries are starting to close. Then I feel like, okay, I can wake up the patient and keep the blood pressure less than 120. But in the very large artery feeding AVMs, uh, the mean arterial pressure, I asked the team less than 70 millimeters mercury. And in most cases that requires sedation plus the nicardipine drip, nitroprusside drip, oral antihypertensives, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, the whole nine yards. And of course there is morbidity because of this, but it is a short-term morbidity. And, and I think it's worth it to avoid high, uh, hemorrhage. I, I can say in those cases that um, I have had two very large postoperative hemorrhage cases when the blood pressure was lifted too early, and, and that's terrible. You know, it's very difficult to fix that problem. Thank you. Uh, people say that maybe that's from residual AVM. I, I don't think so. I think it's there is arteriovenous capillary hypertension. These arteries are somewhere dilated because they're large. We ablate, and now boom, boom, boom. Right? So we have to wait until the arteries come down in size to make it safe. How often are you doing the reception of AVM in the hybrid room? Uh, never. Never, okay. So and when she... you do the angiogram after the surgery, you, you mentioned you do the angiogram just uh, immediately after the yeah. uh, reception. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we just close the operating theater, close the head, move the patient to the angio room and get a good biplane angiography. Eventually, our hybrid suite is designed for open surgery and biplane angiography, but the level of complexity from nursing logistics to have the operating room nurses come to INR for very difficult AVMs is still a work in progress, but that is the best solution one day. Spinal okay, AVMs, I think we can do in the hybrid suite, and we do that. We, we have the angio spinal AVM is much, much, okay, it's okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor Nido Patel. It was a great lecture. As our previous speaker, Professor Hong Tao mentioned, Professor Lawton's words that uh, aneurysm clipping is an elegant dance, whereas AVM surgery is battle. But today you showed that AVM surgery can also be an elegant dance. It was a wonderful presentation. I would like to ask you, how do you weigh the benefits between uh, vasospasm and infarction versus reperfusion bleed in induced hypotension in post-operative patients of AVM? And my second question is like, what is the setting of bipolar that you use to go around an itis? I can answer the second question easier. So I'll start with that. The uh, three sizes of bipolar, 0.5 tip, 1.5 tip, and 1.0 tip, three sizes. And the setting is that I go to 25 on the malice bipolar. And depending on the tightness of the nidus against the tissue, that's the size of the bipolar. That I think is the most important. When you're in a motor cortex, thalamus, you know, eloquent area, 0.5 millimeter, very slow, methodical dissection. When you're in the frontal lobe that's not eloquent, you, you want to do 
faster, you have more room, 1.5 millimeter bipolar set on 25. But the reason the AVM doesn't pop is because you made it soft. That, that's the key. That's why it's not popping. Now, the deep red devils, as they talk about, that's where we put Dr. Sun's clips, take the turber out of the vessel. Now we can safely bipolar it, and I'm not chasing it. Uh, I think his idea was so smart that, you know, you put the clip, now there's not tremendous buildup of pressure in that uh, very thin wall artery. So that's safe, that's better. First question about vasospasm, that's a great question. If the patient is timing, if the patient has a subarachnoid hemorrhage and I can wait to do the AVN, maybe I should wait three weeks and be completely done with the vasospasm. If, if we're not worried about vasospasm or uh, needs urgent operation, then we do it, we put the induced hypotension, and I, I have not seen, knock on wood, I have not seen stroke or vasospasm in the induced hypotensive setting. Um, what it prevents is breakthrough bleeding. And either that is coming from retainitis or large arteries feeding the AVM that has now been ablated or even adjacent capillary hypertension, hypertension. Whatever it is, if the nursing staff keeps the blood pressure down, we'll be safe. It should be okay. Right. Thank you. Another question is, how do you prepare a patient before surgery? Do you use any beta blockers to prevent yeah. any reperfusion breakthrough? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I should have mentioned uh, Kepra, 500 BID, uh, night before surgery, and metoprolol, a beta blocker, 25 BID. And then uh, if it's a large AVM that we're going to do the hypotension, then we add next day, we're going to add ACE inhibitor, ARB, all oral antihypertensives, plus the drips, plus the sedation. But if it's not a large AVM, then the blood pressure can be systolic under 120 rather easily. And, and we, it's a different story, uh, completely different postoperative care. You know, with the large AVMs, it's a team effort. The postoperative care is as important as the, as the surgery. Uh, you know, keeping that blood pressure low is, I think it's very, very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Our co-host, Dr. Lee Boon Sen. Yeah, thank you, Raja. Uh, thank you, Professor Patel, for very nice. Uh, two things I learned from here is even the spazzler fonts see you operating on, and also uh, the, the, another case that we usually don't do in acute bleed uh, immediate resection. So may I know that in what cases that you think that you will not do resection at the same time during the acute hemorrhage? And uh, sec second question is about the uh, SM2 in illiquid area. Would you now prefer uh, radio surgery or still uh, micro surgery? Thank you, Professor. Okay, yeah, great question. Thanks. So the first question, I, um, uh, I guess you, so to just say the first one again, so I yeah, can. Yeah, about the uh, special upon uh, C is your operative target where other people do not operate. And, and, and also in acute bleed, you tackle okay. the AVM together. So what are your considerations? Um, I guess the consideration for which our AVM should be operated is probably not based on grade. It's probably more based on if you can do the case and can the patient withstand what you're about to do to him or her. Uh, that's a very nuanced discussion between the surgeon and the the patient, you know, some patients will tolerate the risk of a quadrinopia or hemianopia for a cure of a large AVM. Um, so that's a very nuanced discussion. Uh, timing, the second question is about timing of ruptured. I like to take care of it. If I feel I can safely remove the AVM in the acute phase, I would rather get it done. I think that's a personality issue. I also had one case where he re-ruptured. I don't ever want to see that happen. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to do it that way. You can wait, let it cool off. And in the cases that are too difficult, too swollen, I will wait, maybe do craniectomy. And the other thing is the um, vasospasm. As I mentioned, if there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think we should wait until all the subarachnoid hemorrhage go on 21 days. Um, and then the last question was, uh, which one was the yeah. SM2 in illicit area? Would you consider oh, okay. radio surgery? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think microsurgery is built for SM1s and SM2. No question. If you can operate it, 
it is better than radio surgery because radio surgery takes two to four years. Um, radio surgery is best for small AVMs, which is best for microsurgery. Our complication rate for grade ones and twos is very, very low. It's lower than MCA aneurysm. I, I hopefully that's not too bold of a statement, but I think what I'm getting at is it can be done safely for a frontal AVM in a non-eloquent area, or if it is eloquent, if it's small, I think it does make a big difference and, and microsurgery should be entertained. Uh, the cases that we don't do, we, you know, if it's too big, AVM is too dangerous, not going to do it. Um, uh, if this patient is too old, they're not going to live 10 years, not going to do it. Too many morbidities, not going to benefit, not going to do it. So I think, you know, we do have many cases we don't do. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. We will take one last comment from Professor Omar, who has joined us from Syria. Hello, Dr. Raja. How are you, Professor Raja? Thank you for uh, all the Thank you very much for you. Very nice uh, uh, presentation. Uh, this is very nice uh, videos. I, I come uh, late one hour, you know. At the, at the beginning. That's okay. You can watch the recorded okay. version as well. It's very Thank nice. Uh, yesterday, uh, two, two days, I uh, make uh, ABM also, like uh, inside the cerebral hematoma site. Uh, okay. Nice, uh, like technique. Thank you very much for all. Thank you very much. That was a from Syria. We can go back to our chair, Professor Hongbo, to hear his concluding remarks. Professor Hongbo. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel, your excellent presentation about the AVM resection. And I'm very uh, much impressed. And uh, thank you also for the very good discussion between us. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes, Professor Shubin. Yeah, today we have a, a 1,300 audience in, in the WeChat channel. <laughs> great. But there, a lot of audience. <laughs> Patel is famous in China. <laughs> also, thank you, uh, Professor Sun Li Yong. Very nice presentation. Yeah. yeah excellent. excellent presentation. So, I would like to wind this up officially now. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Sun Leong and Professor Niro Patel, as well as both the chairs, Professor Hongbo and Professor Shubin, for coming here and teaching us a great deal about both the AVM surgeries and dural uh, AV fistulas. So thank you everybody for joining. My dear co-host Liu Bun Sen for joining us today and all the distinguished faculties and guests who join us to view this webinar. Until we all meet on the 1st of May, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much.